it's, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, today and also to be in this particular place today. Uh, as uh, Stefano pointed out, uh, tomorrow is the 25th anniversary of the stock market crash of 1987. And it reminds me of the time I spent uh, at that time uh, working for the Brady Commission, which studied the stock market crash in 1987. Um, and the place reminds me of where I studied as a student. I didn't study in Italy, but I studied at Oxford University. And uh, it, being here and being at Oxford University always reminds me of how learning is accumulated over many, many years, and you have to pay attention to history uh, when you try to understand things. In finance, we sometimes uh, think of history as being only uh, one or two or three or maybe a maximum of 10 years ago. Um, I'm going to today not go back to 202 years. I'm going to go back to the 1929 stock market crash uh, to see if there are any lessons that we can learn about uh, financial stability uh, that we can apply today. Um, what, what I would like to do is, is try to make some practical comments about a research agenda uh, that I have undertaken with Professor Anna Obajayeva, a colleague of mine at the uh, Uni University of Maryland um, in College Park, Maryland. Uh, there, there are four or five different papers that I want to talk about, um, but in particular there's one on stock market crashes uh, that's going to be the focus of my comments. But in order to understand that, we, we need to uh, see a, a bigger picture. Uh, and the, and the, the picture is one where we're taking some very academic sounding research but applying it to some very uh, practical problems, and namely the problem of stock market crashes. And the academic research is something that we have called uh, market microstructure invariance. So I've, I've called this talk market microstructure invariance and stock market crashes. Um, and let me, let me give you the basic idea of what the connection is between market microstructure invariance and stock market, cr uh, uh, and, and stock market crashes. Um, Market microstructure invariance is uh, it's kind of a, 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 just an idea or a principle uh, that we think, uh, it's, it's really an empirical hypothesis, that we think uh, might be applicable to many different markets, um, stock markets, bond markets, foreign currency markets, but we've been focusing our research on stock, uh, stock markets. And market microstructure invariance predicts how what we call bet size, which you, you can think of as order size, uh, but if you think in terms of speculation, you can think in terms of uh, the size of the position that, that, that people take. Uh, we recently heard about a, a large bet taken by a trader um, at J.P. Morgan that's destabilized that, that bank. Uh, that's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about a bet. Um, and indeed, that particular bet is, is gigantic even by the standards of uh, what we're talking about here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to, to use some data uh, on routine trades and stocks and, and U.S. stocks, mostly by long-only investors, not by people uh, selling, uh, selling stock. In fact, I think it's 100% long-only investors, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, we're going we're to look at 400,000 uh, portfolio transition trades and see if these principles of market microstructure invariance apply across a universe of American stocks, which consists of some very small companies and some very large companies. The sizes of these companies in terms of trading volume and market capitalization vary by a factor of about 1,000. So there's a huge variation in the size of listed companies from you know, Apple being you know, uh, up to 600 billion in market capitalization down to companies that are less than 1 billion. So it's a factor of 1,000 and trading volume tends to be proportional to market capitalization. So trading volume also varies by a factor uh, of 1,000. And then what we're gonna do is take results from markets where we've looked at uh, a thousand-fold variation in stock size and move even bigger. We're going to view, view the market as a whole as one big market. Uh, that's exactly what the Brady Commission did after the 1987 stock market crash. They said the stock market can be viewed as one large integrated market. At that time, stock index futures uh, were relatively new, but they were functioning uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that uh, allowed arbitrageurs to buy and sell the stocks and the futures contracts to kind of integrate the market. <clears throat> and the trading activity in the futures market was hundreds of times larger than the trading activity in the individual stocks. So instead of, we're gonna take a variation that's of a factor of 1,000 and make it essentially like a factor of 100,000 and, and see if the predictions that we make from our typical size stocks actually can apply to the market as a whole. And if they can, can we predict 
the uh, magnitude of stock market crashes, the frequency of stock market crashes, and the size of stock, stock market crashes, given information about the quantities that our people are selling. So there are two types of market crashes, and I, I know that everybody, uh, including myself, I wish I were talking about banking crises and sovereign defaults. Um, so there, there's the, the type of uh, activity documented in Reinhardt and Rogoff's book, This Time is Different, talks about um, a, a collapse of banking systems, exchange rate crises, currency crises, high bouts of inflation, um, and typically big deep recessions that take many years to resolve themselves and also happen to be associated typically with problems in the banking systems. Um, that's not mainly what I'm talking about today, although I, I think my comments are going to be re relevant to that in the long run. Today I'm talking about stock market crashes, um, and these are crashes or panic, panics that are, are typically associated with some entity going into the market and selling a gigantic amount of stock, resulting in a huge decline in stock market prices. Um, and it, you may or may not have a big recession or a, a, a financial crisis uh, following that. Um, th we're going to look at five <coughs> uh, different events. And the reason we chose these five events is that we have data on the magnitudes of the selling that was going on in these five events. Two, two of the five events um, are uh, situations where it was not one entity making sales in the market, but rather many different uh, individuals or institutions uh, kind of following the same strategy or doing the same thing at the same time, uh, and, and in particular over a reasonably short period of time. In 1929, uh, you had a lot of margin purchases of stock. There was a lot of leverage in the uh, stock market, and that leverage all unraveled over the period, not all, but a large fraction of it unraveled over the period of about five weeks, from the last week of October 1929 through the end of November 1929. That was accompanied by a huge amount of selling in the stock market and a very large decline in stock market prices. Um, it did not immediately result in the Great Depression, but it was a kind of signal that the Great Depression was coming. So the Great Depression started uh, a couple of years later and was a problem into the 1930s. <clears throat> in 1987, there was a strategy called portfolio insurance uh, that was essentially um, a strategy of buying when prices rose and selling when prices fell to lock in or protect stock market gains, replicating something like uh, options. And there they were a number of different institutional investors practicing this, and I, I know a lot about this, uh, not only from working in the, for the Brady Commission after the 1987 crash, but also for being a professor at the University of California at Berkeley, where two of my colleagues, Hane Leland and Mark Rubenstein, were kind of the, the inventors of portfolio insurance, and they had uh, marketed this idea to the uh, institutional investor community, and the institutional investor community uh, had, had bought it. Um, portfolio insurance became very popular, and as a result, you had many institutions that were practicing it in, in October of 1987. They all wanted to, to, to buy at the same time or sell at the same time, depending on whether markets went up or down. It turned out markets went down, they all wanted to sell at the same time, and you got the stock market crash of 1987. Um, and you might ask, ask yourself the question, in case I forget to say it, I want to say it now. Um, you might ask yourself the question, are there any strategies like that being practiced now? And I would like to point to one thing that I think is potentially systemically important, although it hasn't reached quite the size of portfolio insurance in 1987, and that's leveraged ETFs. So uh, as some of you may know, you have exchange-traded funds, which uh, in many ways were invented uh, as a replacement for portfolio insurance. Uh, it, was, it was a way for institutional investors to implement strategies involving the whole stock market. But a more recent innovation in the concept of exchange-traded funds are, are levered and short ETFs. So in a levered ETF, uh, you might invest a uh, million dollars in the ETF, but the ETF is going to buy two or three million dollars of stock, essentially uh, borrowing uh, money to make additional stock purchases or, as a practical matter, using derivatives to mimic uh, that leverage. <clears throat> and so they will be levered uh, two or three to one. If you put money into a levered ETF, and the market goes up, uh, and let's say the ETF is supposed to be levered three to one. If the market starts going up, the uh, the value of the the net asset value of the ETF starts is going up faster than the value of the stock position. So you need to let, buy more stock to keep your leverage at three to one. And so levered ETF, a long levered ETF buys 
as the market goes up and sells as the market goes down. It's very similar to portfolio insurance. Uh, there are also uh, ETFs that are short ETFs, and you might think that short ETFs do the opposite, but they don't. If you're, short, if, if you're in a short ETF and the market goes down, uh, you're making money because your ETF is short. But your, the size of your position is not increasing as fast as you're making money. So you need to sell more stock to keep your short position at its target level. So the result is that short ETFs also sell when the market goes down and buy when the market goes up. They both engage in destabilizing trading like portfolio insurance. I think it's something that, that uh, kind of regulators and systemic risk people should keep an eye on, and it's very related to portfolio insurance. At any rate, um, there are three other crashes uh, I want to look at. In 1987, again, 25 years ago, but, <clears throat> but not 25 years ago tomorrow, 25 years ago, four days from tomorrow, three days after the 87 stock market crash, George Soros, it, it seems to me that he panicked and he, he placed a gigantic order to sell a huge numbers of, number of futures contracts at the open of trading on Thursday after the Monday stock market crash. The market opened something like 20% lower. So he triggered a flash crash. This is, didn't have anything to do with computers, and it had everything to do with human beings. Um, he triggered a flash crash uh, uh, without computers in the futures market, and 20% of the entire market capitalization of the U.S. Uh, stock market was wiped out for a matter of time, but only for a matter of uh, minutes. Within a couple of hours, the market had fully recovered, and Mr. Soros had lost a lot of money. Um, but it's, an interesting, it's interesting to know that there have been flash crashes before, and indeed there have been uh, more flash crashes than this one. Uh, there was one in 1989, um, <clears throat> and there was one in 1961, um, but we've not been able to get good data on the quantities that were being uh, bought and sold in those flash crashes, even though they were studied. Um, the two other crashes that were studied, studied are actually recent and uh, are actually kind of part of the history of the financial crisis that the world is, uh, and you know, Europe and the United States in particular, have been uh, undergoing. Uh, the first one is in 2008. Many people seem to have forgotten the systemic importance of Societe Generale's uh, problems with the rogue trader Jerome Creviel. Uh, they discovered his position according to their report over a weekend in uh, January, approximately January 20th, <clears throat> 19th and 20th, 2008. And then on the 21st to the 23rd, they sold 50 billion euros of futures contracts on various European indices. Um, this is a, 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 a size of selling that's more than 10 times larger than what was involved in the flash crash. Um, and you might think, well, didn't it, did it, did it create a, a stock market crash? And the answer is, uh, stock market prices did go down more than 10%. Um, for regulators, this is a very interesting one because the Societe Generale report says that the people at Societe Generale told, um, I, I think it was the president of the central bank, but I'm not sure, it's told some of the, the uh, systemically important uh, officials in France um, what was going on, but they didn't tell all of the politicians in France. They instead kept it secret. Um, and gave them three days to liquidate their position in secret Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, January 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of 2008, after which it was going to become public. So Societe Generale went and s supposedly secretly sold 50 billion euros of, um, of um, stock index futures contracts. The market plummeted, and the, the U.S. Uh, had a, an emergency meeting of the uh, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, and they cut interest rates in an emergency meeting by 75 basis points. is the largest cut that you, know, you can possibly imagine. Um, and this was in, it's not clear to me what exactly they knew about Societe Generale when they did this, but they did know that there was kind of a, a stock market crisis pending. So this is kind of like the, the stock market crash of 29, but not, not, uh, not by any means that large, in that it was followed by uh, a financial crisis. So three months later, Bear Stearns failed. Um, six months after that, Lehman failed, and then we entered into a kind of a full-blown financial crisis with a very large recession. I, I kind of think that the Societe Generale event and even the stock market crash in 1929 pr may, may have something to do with the fact that there was a, a financial crisis following them, but it, it must be very indirect. And similarly, in, stock, in 1987, there, w there was not a recession that, that came after the 1987 stock market crash. Uh, it kind of came and went, and um, uh, I think the policymakers had a good response to it. And then in our, fifth, our fifth example is the flash crash of 2010. 
uh, where a, a joint study uh, by the SEC, a CFTC and the SEC identified approximately $4 billion in sales of futures contracts by one entity as a trigger for the event. I actually was doing some research at the CFTC um, on high-frequency trading, and our research on high-frequency trading was well underway uh, when, the, when the crash occurred, so we were quickly able to identify kind of who was buying and who was selling at that time, and those results were the results that kind of went into the uh, CFTC and SEC report um, and, and led to the $4 billion uh, sale by one entity as being pointed out as important in that situation. <clears throat> so what are we going to do in this paper? Well, we're going to question some conventional wisdom. <laughs> um, so the conventional wisdom, and unfortunately I'm putting myself up against some formidable opponents here, uh, is uh, Myron Scholes and Merton Miller and Eugene Fama and Hayne Leland and Mark Rubenstein. Uh, lots of, they're all, all well-known finance professors who have uh, stated that the quantities that have been identified as being dumped into the market and as sort of uh, sales during these events should not have had such significant price event, such such significant price impact as to cause the crashes that were associated uh, with this selling. Um, the usual conventional wisdom usually says that trading 1% of market capitalization moves prices by no more than 1%, um, maybe a lot less than 1%, and therefore uh, you would not expect $4 billion in sales to be associated with a 5% with a drop in the uh, entire value of the stock market. $4 billion is just a tiny fraction of 1% of the market cap of the uh, uh, U.S. stock market. Um, there's a good quote from Merton Miller in 1991 writing about the 87 crash, and, and I must say I was on the other side. I, I'm a great admirer of Merton Miller, and one of the fondest memories of my life being a, a student at the University of Chicago was stopping at a light as a pedestrian to cross the street, and Merton Miller showed up at the same light, and we sat there and talked about my dissertation for like an hour <laughs> while we were uh, let many, many green lights pass, uh, but he got interested in what I was working on. But on the 87 crash, we, we kind of wound up on different sides of the argument, and he has, I have a quote here from him, uh, putting a major share of the blame for the 87 crash, which would be 25 years ago, on portfolio insurance for creating and overinflating a liquidity bubble in 1987 is fashionable, but not easy to square with all the relevant facts. No study of price quantity response of stock prices to date supports the notion that so large a price, uh, uh, I meant to say decrease there, that's a typo, price decrease of about 30%, but we'd be required to absorb so modest a 1% or 2% net addition to the demand for shares. Um, so what we're doing today is I think we're supplying a kind of a, a model or a study um, to su support the idea that very small quantities dumped into the market can, can lead to very large price uh, dislocations, especially when you're talking about the market as a whole. Um, the theory I'm going to advance is, is, is basically going to say the bigger the market, the smaller the order imbalance as a fraction of that market it takes to generate a very large price change. Um, so big markets like the stock market as a whole is going to be more fragile in some sense than the individual markets for the stocks. Um, that make up the stock market. Um, and we, we disagree, and we also think that the evidence, the historical evidence has been on our side. You know, the puzzle has been why did stock market crashes actually occur in the presence of large selling, but not selling that's not so large that, um, that's smaller than what people thought should have been necessary to cause it. But we're also going to disagree with some other people who are very well known. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, 1936, uh, uh, Akerlof and Schiller, more recently, um, the, the idea that animal spirits generate price fluctuations. In all of these five crash events that we're looking at, it's hard to point to changes in animal spirits or psychology that were occurring before the events actually occurred. It's easy to identify a change in psychology that occurs after the market has gone down 20%. Yes, everybody gets upset and everybody panics. But it's not like a panic leads to the decline. It's like a decline uh, makes people panicky. Um, so we disagree with the idea that animal spirits are what, what generate these crashes. We think it's just quantities being dumped on the market kind of out of nowhere um, and not, not accompanied by any changes in psychology, maybe accompanied by a mechanical rule being followed. Um, so our main result uh, is that given information about the dollar magnitudes of potential selling pressure, which was known before these crashes occurred, in the two cases of many, many people following the same strategies, uh, th these were discussed and debated in the newspapers and conferences. Um, you know, there were, when the stock market crash in 1987 occurred, there, were, there was a conference being held where the, the possibility of a crash was debated. Um, 
the 1929 crash was studied uh, for years before it occurred. Uh, the, in the 1987 crash, the SEC did a study of the 1987 stock market crash almost a year before the crash occurred. They painted the picture. They, they, uh, they collected the numbers. The picture was correct. The numbers were correct. And they painted a scenario. They called it the Cascade scenario that was very accurate, except for the fact at the end of the report they said, we talked to people on Wall Street, and they said it's not going to occur, so we think it's not going to occur. <laughs> but they, they uh, told us all about it <laughs> before it happened. Um, so, uh, and the same was true for 1929. Um, now, for the other three crashes, the, the, it, they were kind of secrets, right? The, uh, only George Soros knew what he was going to do. Only Societe Generale, presumably, knew about Jerome Curviel. And then the flash crash of 2010, only the large trader there knew that what he was about to sell. But they had very precise knowledge in all three cases of exactly what they were going to sell. Um, and they sold exactly what they uh, planned to sell, despite the big uh, disruption that, in my opinion, uh, these, the selling caused. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes. What, what's my time? frame here. How, many, how much time do I have before I should finish? Okay, so I should finish before 5 o'clock. So, yeah, yeah, okay. That'd be good. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this micro, market microstructure and variance uh, concept. Um, but, the, and I'm going to, but I'm going to talk about it very briefly uh, in the, abs, in the um, interest of saving time. But the basic invariance principle says that trading in uh, any asset that kind of looks speculative, even though we really have in mind long-only investors doing research and, and, and picking stocks, um, long, uh, that, that the, you can think of picking stocks as, as sort of betting on different stocks. We think that the speed with which the market works is different in different markets, that in, in small stocks where the trading activity is maybe $10 million a day, uh, those markets operate very slowly. In, in, a, in a very active market where the trading activity might be a billion dollars a day, those markets, you can think of time as passing very, very quickly. And so what we think <clears throat> is that if you abstract from the fact that time is, business time is passing quickly in the, in the active stocks and slowly in the small stocks, and just imagine uh, lining, uh, changing your definition of time so that there's a different clock for every market, um, we think that if you uh, change your, your, your concept of time to line all these markets up so that the time units look the same, then the markets will look the same. That, a, that an active market is not that different from an inactive market. So the, the invariance principle says bet size and business time is the same across all stocks. <clears throat> and what does that lead to? Um, let me, I'm, I may go skip around some slides, I'm going to skip the math in all these slides uh, and go to a picture. Um, so what does that lead to? Let's imagine increasing the size of a market, the increasing the trading activity on a market. Um, and we'll uh, conveniently use increasing the trading activity by a factor of eight because there's some mathematics behind this. So let's imagine a, a market where there are about four bets coming in per day. That doesn't mean, that, and that would be a very tiny market, by the way, uh, but it, 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 it is something I can put on a picture. Um, four bets does not mean there are four trades. Uh, when, a, when, a, when, a, when, a, when an institutional investor decides to buy, let's say, 100,000 shares of stock, uh, in one company, they may place a thousand orders nowadays to buy a hundred shares each, and they may do it over a week or two weeks, depending on, or a few days, depending on the liquidity of the market for that stock. So four bets doesn't mean four orders, it, it might mean 400 orders, um, or 400 trades. But now let's imagine a more interest, uh, uh, there's more interest in that company, the, the stock price maybe goes up, the market capitalization increases by a factor of eight, and the trading volume goes up. So what happens? Do you get more bets, or do the bets get bigger? Essentially, it has to be a kind of a combination of the two things, of bigger bets and, and, and more bets. And what market microstructure invariance leads to, this idea that markets look the same in bet time, it leads to the idea that if the volume in the market goes up by a factor of eight, the bets get twice as large, but they're four times as many bets. So it, it turns out you have to take the two-thirds power of eight to, to figure out how many bets there are and the one-third cube root of eight to figure out how big the bets are. And why is this consistent in, with, uh, with, uh, in, with the invariance idea? Well, if, if the bets are getting twice as big, you would think, okay, they're getting twice as risky. And you're right, they're getting twice, and you'd think they're getting twice as, they're getting twice as risky in business time, I mean in uh, calendar time, not in business time. But business time passes very fast. So if you think about how risky they're getting in business time units, since those units are coming faster, if the fundamental volatility of that asset hasn't changed, 
the, the speeding up of business time by a factor of four is, is making the variance of price changes go down by a factor of four. But the proper measure of riskiness is the standard deviation of price changes, which goes down by a factor of two. And that factor of two offsets the doubling of the size of the bets. That's, that's the invariance principle. Um, and it leads to, um, it leads to some formulas. I'm not going to, you don't, don't need to look at the formulas, but, but, it, but it leads uh, instantly uh, to some formulas that say that there's this idea of market velocity or the speed with which time is passing in a market is proportional to the two-thirds power of trading activity. As a, and what does that mean as a practical matter? That means as a practical matter, if we multiply the size of the market by a factor of a thousand, going from, let's say, the market for one stock to the market for a thousand stocks, um, then we're going to multiply the number of bets that are being placed in something like the futures market by a factor of 100. And we're going to increase the size of the bets by a factor of 10. Well, it turns out that you can look in the futures market and see how many people trade in the futures market in one day. And you can also see you know, how big the positions are that they buy and sell. And it turns out um, it kind of matches. It, I'm not, I can't say it matches exactly because the CFTC um, uh, there's some work we've been doing at the CFTC on these data, but we can't make the data uh, uh, public yet. But basically, the, the, the idea is that, is that it matches. Um, you also get a measure of, of liquidity that falls out. It's kind of a, a measure of market impact that I call L dollars. Uh, but what it is, the measure of liquidity that comes out is that you take the dollar volume in a market, and everybody would think that liquidity increases with dollar volume, and you divide it by the variance of price changes, and everybody would agree that that's kind of appropriate because a higher variance uh, asset is going to have lower liquidity. And then the surprising thing is you take the cube root of it. And if you take the cube root of it, you actually get something that is exactly proportional to the, uh, uh, the, the, the transactions cost, meaning the bid ask spread costs and the market impact costs of executing uh, a bet. Um, so I'm a, that's, that's an implication of the math, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip. Now, you don't look at the equations here either, but there are two ways of kind of testing this idea both of which we did with individual stocks where they vary by a factor of a thousand in size. One way we tested it is to look at the sizes of the bets. We looked at these institutional trades that are called portfolio transitions and we made the hypothesis that they are representative of trades in, by institutional asset managers. And the theory says that if the, 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 the um, trading activity increases by a factor of a thousand, the sizes of these bets should increase by a factor of ten. And I, and on, we also have a formula for market impact. We can test it that way too. We can look at the trades and try to measure their market impact using a concept called implementation shortfall. Basically, you photograph the price when the trades are initiated and they haven't had an effect on price yet. And then you look at the prices that are actually realized by the trades and see how bad they are in some sense relative to the initial price. You expect some slippage and that's a, that's a measure of a, a both your bid-ask spread costs and market impact costs. And we have a formula here uh, that you don't need to pay too much attention to, but it basically says what the market impact should be as a function of dollar trading volume and volatility. Um, interestingly, it's proportional to the cube root of dollar trading volume. That's that L I was talking about, and it's proportional to the four-thirds power of volatility. So increasing volatility in a market is a really uh, increasing transactions cost by an enormous amount, and you heard people during the financial crisis complaining about that, both in stock and bond uh, markets. So we tested it both ways, and the bottom line was, um, I'm going to skip, the bottom line was the tests actually make our theory look very good. This is a picture, uh, the theory is called invariance, and the, the invariance principle says that if you correct the, tr the, the size of the trades uh, by this uh, uh, cube root, if you will, of dollar volume, which is to say to, to change the expected size of the trade. So if you increase dollar volume by a factor of 1,000, you increase trade size by a factor of 10. So if you build that correction in, you should get a distribution of sizes of bets that's the same for stocks that have different dollar trading volume levels and different uh, volatilities. So what we did is we sorted the stocks into different volume and volatility levels, and then we calculated the distribution. And what you're looking at in the picture on the graph is 15 different distributions, which according to our theory should all be the same. The kind of orange or brown or yellow uh, is the empirical distribution of what the, the, the um, sizes of these bets actually are. And there's a normal distribution superimposed over them. Uh, that normal distribution is the same normal distribution for every single uh, bin, except it's been corrected for this uh, size, size effect that we think uh, we're, we're trying to capture. And once you correct for the size effect, what should be the case is that you should be looking at a, a yellow empirical distribution that fits very closely to the red 
uh, hypothesized distribution, and you can see visually that it fits almost perfectly. Um, I should add, though, that this is um, <clears throat> the log of the trade size, <laughs> uh, not the actual trade size. Um, so what we and, and it's a normal distribution they're com they're fitting with. So what we found is that the distribution of trade size fits what. Uh, uh, you know, statisticians call a log normal distribution, and it the log normal distribution has a an enormous uh, standard deviation or variance, meaning that if you increase the size of a bet by one standard deviation, you're increasing it by a factor of five. So this means a as it has a very practical implication. If you means if you're looking at a four or five standard deviation event, which is what a, a market crash would be caused by you're looking at something that's maybe 600 to 3,000 times bigger than the median bet. So if we know what the median bet is, we can predict how big a bet it's going to take to make a market have a four or five standard deviation event and perhaps crash. So, and that's, uh, it, it turns out actually that the flash crash is very, very consistent with these numbers, um, even though these numbers have nothing to do with futures markets and nothing to do with um, uh, the market as a whole. The numbers based on individual stocks. <clears throat> um, okay. So we did some statistical tests, and the statistical tests I'm going to skip, but that we basically get a regression coefficient that's, that's close to what we were predicting. We're predicting minus two-thirds here, and if you look at the red number, it's minus 0.63. It's pretty close to two-thirds. Um, now, we also um, d estimated a model. You don't have to look at this equation either, but it's a model of transactions costs based on this implementation shortfall concept that you compare the actual prices you get from a trade with, what, with the prices before you placed it. We have two components here, a bid ask spread or a market impact component and a bid ask spread component. It turns out empirically that the uh, bid ask spread component is only about 15% as much as the market impact component. That's consistent with the conventional wisdom of people on Wall Street that say the market is dominated by big trades and the market impact costs of these big trades are very significant. Um, and they're, they're most of the trading costs that exist in the market. We again did some uh, regressions and we were expecting, um, th there are four numbers that we estimate. Uh, two of the numbers are numbers that we predict to be either one-third or minus one-third. They're called A1 and A2 in this particular graph, and A1 is actually 0 0.33, almost exactly the predicted value of one-third, uh, A1, A0. And A1 is minus 0.39, very close to the predicted value of minus uh, one-third. Um, the other two numbers, called uh, lambda and kappa, are measures in basis points of actual market impact and uh, bid ask spread costs for a typical stock that we've kind of chosen it uh, kind of arbitrarily to be a stock with $40 million a day, typical kind of smaller stock, $40 million a day in trading activity and a 2% a standard deviation of returns. Uh, and so these numbers are chosen so that the 2.85 number you're looking at says that if you trade 1% of average daily volume in a stock with $40 million a day of volume and 2% volatility per day, your, your market impact cost should be 2.85, half your market impact cost should be 2.85 basis points and half of your bid ask spread cost should be uh, six basis points. Um, so those are the numbers that we get and we think that they're close enough to the predicted values of one third and minus one third that we can just assume minus one third and, and one third and uh, that's what we do. Okay, so that gives us uh, the idea um, that, uh, let me, uh, let me go, go through a couple of other things here. Uh, that, that gives us an idea of uh, 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 where we're going to go. We're going to take those numbers cho estimated from individual stocks that, that vary by a factor of 1,000 in trading activity and then go a couple of orders of magnitude bigger and apply it to the market as a whole. But before we go there, let me just mention a couple of statistics. This log normal distribution that we find for bet size says that 50% of the trading volume or the bet volume is generated by the largest 5% of the bets. It's basically saying even in, in the institutional market that we have, it's the big institutions that dominate trading volume. But if you think about price formation or price variance or price volatility, it, it's really their contribution to variance that might measure how important they are. And, and, and the contribution to variance is based on the square of the trade size. So if you're looking at the contribution to price volatility as measured by the variance, which is the right way to do it, half the variance in returns is generated by fewer than one in a thousand bets. So it's only the big bets that are generating the majority of the variance that you see in a market. And that would be true of all the stocks uh, that we looked at in our data because the picture I showed you shows you that that distribution really is invariant across large stocks and small stocks. Um, there's some other uh, ideas here that order imbalances that are important for measuring um, market impact are about 38% of trading volume in a small stock. But when you increase the size of the market by a factor of 1,000, that'll decrease by a factor of 10 to being a 3.8% uh, order imbalance uh, is typical for that market. 
um, or typical, excuse me, is uh, yeah, typical uh, for that market. <clears throat> um, and similarly, the average bet size in a typical stock is about $470,000. If you increase the markets by a factor of 1,000, which is kind of like going to what the, the futures market would be, you'd expect that size to increase by a factor of 10, to be like maybe $5 million. Again, that's, uh, and then you'd expect a four standard deviation event to be 600 times bigger or 1,000 times bigger than that. And, and that is the four billion, that is exactly consistent with the four billion dollar bet that we saw in the flash crash. So uh, this, this, the, this calibration of the model that we have based on individual stocks seems to uh, extrapolate to the market as a whole for stock index futures um, very easily, <clears throat> or very, uh, very accurately. Um, so I've already said that. Um, I, I should say there's a, there's a literature that this is related to, the time change literature that uh, includes uh, some people in this room, I think, other people in this room. Um, I'm going to skip this other stuff. Uh, we get a, so we're, we're going to take our transactions cost formula and we're going to apply it to these five stock market crashes. There's some issues regarding the boundary of the market, whether price impact is permanent or transitory, uh, and so on that we have to deal with. But let me, uh, let me skip those and just talk about the crashes. In 1989, 1929, this is what happened between 1926 and 1930. Uh, from 1926 to October 1929, there was a steady increase in leverage. Uh, this, is, this is margin debt in the system. Uh, there's a steady increase in stock prices. In 19, last week of 1929 and th throughout November, there was a collapse in the amount of leverage in the system and a collapse in stock prices. And what was going on was that margin calls were occurring and people who had bought stock on leverage were being forced out of the market and the market crashed. Uh, if you look at it more closely, um, this measures the selling in the five weeks starting with the last weekend in October. We did a fair amount of research to try to figure out uh, exactly how the markets were handling this. And, and a story of, of uh, I guess a story of what happens in a, in a market that doesn't have any deregulation emerged. And the story actually is pretty favorable for the markets that don't have any deregulation. All these bankers, you know, they didn't have an SEC at that time. Um, the, the bankers all got together in a room in New York and held a meeting, with, invited the press to stand outside and wait, and they, they essentially decided uh, we're going to put together a fund to stabilize prices. It's not going to peg the market at any particular price, but it'll provide stability. We're not going to do anything really fast. Um, and we're, we're going to essentially try to stretch things out a little bit. So um, the small investors were pretty much liquidated that first week um, and even the first day. The big investors got liquidated later, but you can see from the falling blue line that it was the small investors that were the lucky ones, <laughs> not the big investors. <laughs> um, so, and, and then some of the uh, margin loans to the very big investors wound up leaving what in, that, in those days was a kind of shadow banking system called the stock loan market or the broker loan market and went into the banking system and they stayed in the banking system for about a month and then uh, kind of disappeared from the banking statistics indicating that the bankers uh, took loans that were kind of iffy out of the broker loan market, maybe where they would have been uncollateralized, took them onto the bank's balance sheets, and then gave the owners about a month to liquidate their positions. So instead of having a concentrated stock market crash all occurring in one week, uh, or even one day, the, stock, the bankers in New York uh, spread the stock market crash out over an entire month. Nothing like that happened in 1987. And nothing like that happened to Societe Generale in 2008. Societe Generale in 2008 was said you got three days, right? Um, we think this is very important, um, that the market spontaneously stabilized themselves in 29, uh, did no such uh, thing in 87 or, um, or 2008. Um, at any rate, the result. Uh, we predict, our model doesn't, doesn't do very well here, but, but I, I just told you the reason why, I think. We predict a decline of 50% uh, during the last week of October. Uh, actually, the price change is more like 25%, so we predicted a bigger decline than actually occurred. And we would have predicted a decline of like 90% uh, if you took all five weeks into account. That gigantic collapse in leverage sh should have driven the market down 90%. Now, in fact, it did fall 90%, but it took a couple of years. Um, we think what happened was that the market had these built-in stabilizing mechanisms that, that, uh, that dampened its fall. Um, and we have several uh, kind of theories for why the market seems to be so resilient in 1929. One might be a lack of regulation. That's my, I think, the weakest theory. Another might be the market wasn't very well integrated. It may be that, that the market in 1929 really was a market for hundreds of individual stocks, not one big market. 
In 87, I think it's very reasonable to say it was one big market. But, but individual markets for individual stocks, according to our theory, should be much more resilient than one big market. And so we think the resiliency may have to do with lack of market integration. So one lesson here is integrating the markets allows the dealers in the markets to conserve capital. Um, that conservation of capital, though, means that in a, in a, in a systemic situation, uh, when that extra capital might have been needed, it's not available. <laughs> so uh, it's a big problem. Um, I'm going to skip this. I go to the 1987 market crash. The portfolio insurers dumped enormous quantities on the market, $14 billion. Total volume in the market was about $20 billion, of which half was the stock market and half was the futures market. We predicted a decline of uh, approximately 20% based on our model. The actual decline that was experienced was about 32% in the stock market and 40% in the futures market. So we didn't hit it exactly, and the Brady Commission thinks that the market decline was exacerbated by the fact that there were fears about the, the, the mechanism itself, there were fears about the payments mechanism, the clearing systems collapsing, and things like that that were amplifying the crash. And so uh, we, we kind of think that our data is uh, consistent with that. But this number, our prediction of 20%, this is a number that could have easily, easily been calculated before the crash of 1987. The, the regulators and the finance professors and the market as a whole knew these numbers and, and had accurate uh, numbers. They, so they could have uh, done the calculations and, and been expecting a 20% decline. Um, we, we again think these numbers are, are accurate, are, are relatively robust. George Soros uh, dumped all these futures contracts onto the market three days later. Another, a big pension fund also dumped enormous futures contracts. Uh, my understanding is that neither of these uh, sales created short positions. Uh, they were actually hedging, in Soros's case, getting out of a position in the case of the pension fund, hedging a position that they already had. Uh, but at any rate, um, I don't think that part of it matters. Um, the, the two combined, um, we predict, let's put them into our market, and we predict a decline of 7%. The decline in this case was greater, it's the opposite of 1929. It was greater than our model predicts. And we think that the reason it was greater is that the sales were made so fast. So it's pointing to us that we think speed is a huge factor in explaining how deep stock market crashes are going to be. Uh, and the Soros sales in 1987 are a kind of flash crash uh, that occurred 25 years ago, but one that's, that's, that reminds me of the flash crash that occurred in 2010. Um, and we're getting, as we, we, we think it's reasonable for us to get, predictions that are smaller because we wouldn't have predicted that someone would sell that fast. Now, it turns out that the 22% decline was transitory. You know, it went away almost immediately. Um, fraud at Societe Generale, this involves several different European markets. Um, but not <laughs> including, I think, the Spanish market, which actually went down along with all the other markets. So that shows you that the markets in Europe are tied together by arbitrage relationships, even if they're not tied together by volume. Societe Generale said it reported losses of, it reported losses of $6.3 billion. Um, we uh, plugged our, num the numbers into our formula. We predicted a decline of 12.37% in the market. This is what Societe Generale could have predicted if they had used our formula. The actual um, it's, uh, uh, the actual decline um, was 9.44%, so we think it was actually a very reasonable prediction. And the actual amount of money uh, lost uh, was very similar to the amount of money that we think uh, could have been lost. Our, our numbers uh, range from three to eight billion, depending on how we uh, look at the numbers. Um, so uh, let's see, then we look at the flash crash, and I'll be done. Uh, the flash crash uh, was 75,000 contracts of futures con of, uh, in the futures market. It's very much like the Soros flash crash. Our formula predicts a decline of less than 1%. You got a decline of 5%, five times bigger, but it was transitory. And we think it was amplified totally by the speed with which this uh, crash occurred. So we think that speed was very important. Also, on the day that the flash crash occurred, there was a huge amount of speculation about Greece and uh, defaulting on its debt, and the volatility of the market had increased. And if you'd used a higher volatility number, we would have gotten a higher price impact number, something like 1.5%, still sh short of the 5% that you actually saw. So uh, to summarize what we learn about our predictions, and I'm going to stop with this table. What we learned about, uh, from our predictions is that the stock market in 1929 didn't crash as much as you would expect. And we think that was because the selling was spread out over a very long period of time. With Soros and, and the, the two flash crashes, Soros in 2010, the stock market crashed very fast, but then immediately turned around and uh, reversed itself and came back. Uh, we think that's because those traders traded 
really too fast. I think and you might say it's irresponsible, but they certainly paid for it by losing millions of dollars. And then in the other two crashes, 87 and 2008, our numbers are actually pretty accurate. Um, and we think those, that's because those, those crashes occurred at a pace that was so, sort of normal uh, for a market. You know, there, it was reasonably rushed trading, but, but three days, uh, uh, in both cases about three days, is, is, is to us similar to the way in which portfolio transitions are done, even accounting for the smaller size of the portfolio transitions and the smaller speed with which the uh, markets work. So we think our, our model does allow um, systemic events to um, be forecast, and so we think it could be used to create an early warning system for systemic risk. I'm done. Amazing presentation. The uh, one of the, uh, if you want to anticipate uh, those uh, crashes, and uh, I very much appreciate the, your approach. Uh, the, I mean, you, you need to anticipate this nervosity of markets, basically. This is what you try to, to measure. And there is a huge uh, asymmetry uh, when you say, you know, 1%, whether it's one, one way or the other, uh, may have a huge, di uh, very extremely different impact. You mean whether it's buying or selling? Uh, sorry, okay. yeah, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I was thinking of the spikes in the energy market, uh, in, in the electricity market, where you know that the supply is limited. So if you have an increase in demand, the price go up like crazy, and which is exactly the mirror uh, uh, image of what you are describing here in the market, when the contrary, at certain point, uh, the demand disappears, it dries up completely at the same speed at which uh, uh, I was thinking of uh, other events that you didn't mention, but that very the 98 uh, uh, LTCM crisis and the 13th of July 07, uh, where you had this correlation effect uh, because suddenly uh, you have through margin calls, a big cascade where some events on some asset class because of margin calls trigger the whole effect. Um, the, uh, my question is relating to the use of correlations and the use of measures of asymmetry uh, to get a more accurate uh, prediction of, you know, of this nervosity of markets and how to see whether markets can really uh, are ready to blow up. Okay, well, we've, we've thought about all these issues that you're, uh, that you're talking about, and so let me give you my take on it. The, the first issue has to do with fundamentals and, and the... Uh, uh, I, I think of it as, as uh, corners and squeezes. So our, our theory is certainly not going to say that the market can supply liquidity when the physical supplies are constrained and not there. And, and it, what it leads to is a, is, a, is a theory of corners and squeezes. Uh, so for example, it wouldn't quite be applicable to the Hunt Silver crisis, uh, you know, which I also worked on uh, uh, as, um, uh, at, the, at that time. Uh, which would be an example, or some of the things you see in oil or electricity or natural gas, uh, where the, the physical supplies can only move at certain speeds, and even though there is more speculation in these instruments than there is physical capacity to actually move the commodity that amount, it, it creates a, a, an interesting regulatory and, and practical problem of, uh, of, of, of how to handle that. But we don't think our invariance concept is going to handle that. It's going to be constrained by that. That, that's the first point. Your second point, we spent a lot more time thinking about, and it has to do with the correlation issue. So we envision eventually writing a paper on bond markets, a paper on currency markets, a paper on commodity markets, and then we've already done this work on stock markets. And in order to um, do the paper, the other papers, I, uh, or especially the paper on bond markets, uh, we, need, we need to understand how assets are correlated, and bonds are very highly correlated. So to understand bond prices at the market-wide level, uh, we, we, un we need to have a better theory of how, how to define what we mean by one big market, especially when it's uh, one big market of assets that are somewhat highly correlated but not perfectly correlated. In the bond markets, you know, you've got a big interest rate factor. You've also got a big default premium factor that's kind of common across markets that, that, that creates a lot of contagion. And then you've got the idiosyncratic risks associated with the individual bonds. And, and figuring out how to aggregate those up is something we're work, working on now. But we're going to do it for stocks first and then apply it to bonds. Uh, but once we do that, uh, we think we'll have a theory that uh, 
it satisfies uh, your notion that, that we're taking into account correlation and, and using that to measure things. Now, our theory would predict, by the way, that when a very large bet hits the market, such as the Societe Generale liquidation, let's say in 2008, the theory is going to predict that since that's a market-wide event, it's going to result in a lot of volatility in the market. And because the markets, let's say in this case it was European futures, but not every European market, um, because those markets are correlated through the fundamentals, the markets are going to start moving together. And since the, 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 the volatility is going to be high, the correlation is going to be very high. And even the markets that Societe Generale was not selling uh, are going to decline along with the markets that they were selling. Um, even in the 87 crash, you saw that maybe we should have called it a worldwide market because you saw the worldwide market crash even though all the selling was in U.S. stocks. Um, so we, we think that you're going to get, when big bets come into a market where there's a lot of correlation with other assets, that correlation should increase along with volatility increasing while those bets are being kind of executed. And an interesting line of research is thinking of the horizon over which the bets should be executed. Um, and incidentally, we, we put something into the um, flash crash report <clears throat> that was, um, I say we, but the people that wrote the flash crash report put it in there. Um, and based on interviews with market participants, they said that if you were going to sell $4 billion worth of stocks, you wouldn't normally do it over 20 minutes. You would normally do it maybe over a whole day or at least over several hours. I, I don't remember the exact quote, but the, the gist of it was what, it, what I just said. The difference between 20 minutes and several hours might be a factor of 10. So you, you would argue that they maybe sold that, that, that uh, $4 billion too quickly. But if you scale down the market by a factor of 1,000, then 20 minutes becomes 100 times 20 minutes, comes 2,000 minutes. What is that, 30 hours? That's like several days. Um, and what they probably should have done with that big an order, you know, like four or five standard deviation event orders, executed it in a typical smallish stock, it would have been executed over a whole month. And finance professors have databases that look at how institutional investors do execute these large orders, and they do execute large orders over a whole month. So, you know, the, all that fits together with the invariance principle and also seems to me to be very reasonable, and it is exactly what the practitioners in interviews told the CFTC and SEC. very much. Uh, for, uh, tomorrow after lunch, I I'm going to give a talk which is very complimentary to yours. I, I look forward to our discussion together if you stay. Um, I did not get the mechanism for the amplification that you stressed, that you op opposed your theory against the major financial figures, where 1%, let's say, of size might be amplified by 10 to 10, 20%. So you rely everything on this invariance principle, but I didn't get beyond this invariance, which looks like, uh, as you said, hypothesis bay or you know data bays. If you have an understanding of the actually amplifying mechanism, that's the first question. Second question on this uh, graph early warning system, I did not get any sense where this time dimension in your theory, because you predict size and you showed the very nice table of. Uh, um, successes, let's say, but what about the time? So where is actually the window you know, of susceptibility of dangerousness that would appear? You can okay. say that there's enough time, you know, there's an impact that can be this size, but this is what, you know, value trace or SP short for or all this stuff is doing, but what about the timing? Okay, so the, it was buried in the algebra that I skipped, <laughs> kind of uh, in, the, in the middle of my talk, uh, but the algebra was dealing exactly with the issue of time. And so we think each market has a kind of speed with which it operates. And, and, the, and the clock, in some sense, should be one bet is arriving on average, with the bets arrive according, kind of randomly. So the kind of time that you, on average, wait between the arrival of the bets measures how fast the clock in that market is, is operating. That's, a, that's our basic idea. Um, and so then, uh, let, let, me, let me cast the discussion in terms of practitioner wisdom. Many practitioners say, it's okay to be 5% of the trading volume in a stock. Maybe it's okay to be 5% of the trading volume in a stock for several days. It might be pushing it a little bit to be 10% of trading volume, uh, but you wouldn't want to be 10% of trading volume for more than a day or two. Um, so we think the way to extrapolate that is to say, well, if the clock is running 200 times faster, then then it's safe to be 5 per 10 percent of the trading volume for one two hundredth as much time uh, in, the, in the very fast futures market as would be the case in a typical stock market. So if it's okay to be one, uh, 5 percent of trading volume for a week, 
in uh, the market for a typical stock, which might be in terms of six hours a day, 30 hours, however many minutes that is, 2,000 minutes. Maybe that one two hundredth of that is 10 minutes. So uh, you wouldn't want to be uh, a very large fraction of the trading volume for very long in the stock market. And if you are, you're going you're to create the same kind of cascade of prices falling as you would in a, in, a, in a stock if you were that percentage of the trading volume for many, many, many days. OK, so that's the, the basic time thing. Um, so then, if you try to uh, uh, think about the standard deviation of, of order flow imbalances, I, I was casting it in terms of a paper I wrote in 1985 where you've got something called the standard deviation of order flow imbalances. And in that paper, time was called one. <laughs> you know, that there was just one unit of time, and it, it didn't say whether it was an hour, a minute, or a day. Most people who have looked at that model have called it a day. But I think the proper way to look at the model is to call it a different amount of time in different stocks. And if you, if you call it a different amount of time in different stocks, then uh, it's a short amount of time in active stocks and a long amount of time in inactive stocks. And the amount of time it should be is a time unit that represents the same number of bets on average arriving. So when you do some algebra, it's basically saying that in order to measure order flow imbalances, you don't want to measure the order flow imbalance as a standard deviation of daily changes. You want to do it as the standard deviation of units of, say, 100 bets, which might, for some markets, be a day. But for other markets, it might be 10 minutes. And other markets, it might be a month. And when you, when you scale time that way, the invariance principle leads to this idea that the large markets are more fragile than the small markets. And the intuition for that idea is that if you think about what this, if you erroneously use uh, daily data and there are, let's say, uh, 10,000 bets in the market rather than 100, um, the, uh, the adding up of all 10,000 bets is going to result in a, in a very small order flow imbalance as a fraction of average daily volume. But if you're in a market where there are a small number of bets, adding them all up is likely to result in a large order flow imbalance. But the, the depth of the market is uh, going to be appropriate to generate the price and plat pack that generates the <laughs> volatility that we see in those markets. So it must be that in some sense the large markets are less resilient than the small markets because the order flow imbalances are typically a smaller fraction of the size of the volume. But again, it's all in the equations. <laughs> I was trying to give a non-mathematical answer. For your very interesting talk, I understand this idea of invariance, and you want to scale up, you know, variables to match different markets. But what I don't understand is how possibly this could apply to uh, these uh, fire sales or sudden liquidations, because your main assumption is that some things, some things scale up or down with the speed at which normally, you know, the order flow arrives. But if you take a given market participant which has to liquidate quickly a position like Soros or Jerome Kerkerville situation, well, they don't have to liquidate at the normal speed the market trades. Actually, the, these are fire sale situations, so probably they have to liquidate more quickly than the usual pace at which the order flows in that market. And so I don't see why that they would, you know, uh, fall in under that rule. So maybe that's why in these fire sale situations, your predictions are off by a factor five to ten. Maybe it's just because I, I, the exact, you know, scaling doesn't hold for these guys because they have to they have constraints. Okay, so I, I agree with the gist of your comment and the uh, portfolio transition orders that we were using to estimate the the kind of the, the parameters of our model. The portfolio transitions are executed in a manner that we would consider normal. You know, they're, they're, they're executed slowly enough to try to have some sense of minimizing price impact. And you don't have like transitions where some people are in a huge hurry and some people aren't. We, that's the way we, we rate it anyway. And so whether there's a fire sale effect resulting from something uh, like the speed with which the orders are executed, it, it wasn't something we thought we could estimate in our data. So we didn't. So our, our data, our, our, our invariance theory and in, in our price impact measures are price impact measures we think for liquidating a position at a normal rate uh, and not liquidating positions unusually rapidly. So I agree with you, though, that if you do liquidate positions unusually rapidly, you should create more price impact. Uh, uh, Anna Vijayev and I have another paper <laughs> that we're working on with, a, with, an assistant, with Yajin Wang, a assistant professor, another one at, at Maryland. And it actually has this feature that if you, there's an expected rate at which markets think things are being done, but if you deviate from market expectations and do something really fast, like if you have a fire sale, um, then there will be a huge amount of price impact that will be transitory. 
On the other hand, if you deviate from market expectations and do things a lot more slowly than the market expects, you can kind of reduce your market impact costs by about 50%. Um, that, that's kind of what, what comes out of that model, and, and we think that's kind of uh, the, the, the right lesson. And so what we see is George Soros and we see uh, the flash crash people staging a fire sale that seems to have been totally unnecessary. <laughs> I don't know why they did it, but they lost a lot of money and showed how expensive it was and gave us a good, good sample. And then we have Societe Generale, which felt like it was under a lot of pressure uh, because evidently its regulator gave them three days, and so they, they did a fire sale, and we see that the market went down 10%, but that fire set three days might have been about right because we think 10% for a reasonably you know, fast trade might have been okay. Had they done it extremely slowly, you know, over six months or something, um, you know, maybe the market impact costs would have been lower, but the stock market might have crashed, which I think maybe it did, and so <laughs> they, uh, they may have been even worse off. Um, so very, you've, you've raised a very interesting point. Um, and it, the, you know, part of the point is we, we agree that, that, that fire sale prices are likely to occur when things are liquidated very quickly. And by the way, let me, on, the, on the issue of fire sales, let me make one other point. There's something in here called L. It's a general measure of liquidity that, that we have. That's the dollar volume divided by variance, but then you take the cube root of it. We think that that is a measure both of trading, what's called, what finance professors call trading liquidity and funding liquidity. And the reason we th it'd be like funding liquidity in the repo market is a number that would be used to generate haircuts in the repo market. Fluctuations in that number would then generate fluctuations in repo haircuts. And the reason we think it's the right number to use is that it does have a time dimension in it. And we think that uh, funding haircuts in the repo market would ultimately depend over the time frame over which you would liquidate collateral if you had to seize it because the counterparty defaulted. And that, that's part of the speed with which the market works. So the, so the haircuts will be much lower in very active markets like, say, U.S. government bonds, and the haircuts will be much higher in very inactive markets like uh, derivatives for uh, housing-backed uh, you know, uh, housing uh, bonds.